Hello, everyone. Hello. That actually works. Um, I'm Dr. Saskia Vandegevel. I'm chair of Geography and Planning. And thank you all for being here today to help us um, welcome Dawa and her incredible journey of climbing, being a top elite mountain guide, and um, being an inspiration for even children's books related to climbing in K2. So thank you so much. I wanted to, um, I'll pass around Dawa's poster to explaining more. And there's also a wonderful Outside Magazine article about her life and her interest in climbing as a young girl, the opportunities she had to navigate to do that, um, people she's met along the way that have inspired her and the many people that she's inspired. Um, our next speaker, if uh, you're able to attend, is Dr. Po Yi Hung on March 31st as well. So I'll pass around both of these flyers. Right now, I'd like to introduce Dr. Baker Carey to give Dow a more formal introduction. And also, Dan Yabab, which is thank you in Nepali. <laughs> thank you. And welcome, everybody. It's uh, fantastic to be here to welcome Dawa in particular. So Dawa grew up in a remote Himalayan village. And at age nine, she knew that she wanted to climb Mount Everest someday. And, uh, and she ended up doing that and has done a lot more. She's the first Nepali woman to earn Mountaineering's most elite title of international certified guide. And she's the youngest female ever to summit K2, the second highest mountain in the world. And I got to work closely with her in 2019 as part of our National Geographic and Rolex Perpetual Planet Expedition to Mount Everest. And Dawa was a critical member of our team, helped with the weather, I think with just about every one of the weather station installations, especially at the balcony. And most importantly, she made sure we got down safely and paid close attention to our safety along the route. We have just tremendous uh, respect and confidence in, uh, in her ability uh, as a guide, as a team member, and she's just uh, really an incredible role model for girls and women. She'll talk more about that. It just is a, it's a just incredible person to be around. Dr. Vandegovel mentioned that she's in a kid's book. And here it is, it's called Daring to Dream, Sherpa Women Climbing K2. Okay, that was published in Nepal. And uh, you're welcome to look at this too, uh, on the way out. So thank you, and we're excited to welcome you here. Dawa. Hello everyone, namaste. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm so honored to be here. And I'm not a great speaker, so I'm, I'm sorry if I have a, if, let me know if I'm a little loose. What is I have not a loud voice, so but thank you for that. And so I was born in Rowali Valley, which is a very remote village. This is 4,200 meter, which is 14,000 feet. And it, this is, Rowali is like west from the Abbas region uh, because this is not a really popular area. So it's in west from the Kungu region. And Rowali is like, of, of course, it's very remote village. Uh, life there was very hard. Growing up, uh, we didn't have uh, like electricity, running water. And I think, I believe uh, it was that physical difficult a childhood actually prepared me what I'm uh, physically and mentally demanding passion as a climber. So, uh, so growing up, I just wanted to seek new adventure. But as a woman, everybody we not not really encouraged into a climbing or uh, outdoor activity back in days, and so it was kind of hard to get out from the town or. Uh, what you dream about and actually I grew up around mountains so I used to did not like mountains <laughs> but I really hate it because uh, every time I see mountains uh, but then I because uh, 
most of my financial income source are uh, tourism in our country, and all the men's need for expedition in beginning of spring, and they come back and. So all the men leaves for expedition and uh, go to Mount Everest and lot, had a lot of stories and they uh, they come back with really fancy stuff. So I always wanted to go and climb Mount Everest and uh, I want to be famous. That was my <laughs> So I I always wanted to climb Mount Everest and for climbing Mount Everest you need to. Um, uh, yeah, so <laughs> climbing, uh, like when you're when you're a woman, then if you want to climb, nobody takes you. Just like okay, let's go. But comparing men, they take my uncles, cousins. They will take with them, and they help to, to climb it. For a woman, they don't trust it. So I had to go through a lot of training courses. So so therefore, I had a, I had to took option. I had to leave my hometown, age of thirteen. <laughs> I actually I ran away, and, uh, <laughs> so therefore, I, and then I went to uh, I looked a lot of options that was available for the training courses, and the best training course I found was at Kumbu Climbing Center, which is founded by Conrad Anchor and Jenny Lo Anchor, and I met Conrad during my courses. So, um, so after I went through the courses, training courses. Uh, I, I first tried to climb the Mount Cheki Go, which is right above my village. And it was just only 20, this is the, uh, uh, this is, uh, next slide. So this is my first mountain. This is just uh, 20,000 feet, but it's kind of a difficult mountain. So, <laughs> and uh, it was just right above my hometown and I grew up looking this mountain. And, uh, I was only dreaming about Mount Everest. Uh, I thought it's bigger, cooler. I think this is like, oh, I don't, I didn't like it. <laughs> but I, it, it was a very tough mountain and uh, it was my beginning of the career as a climber, looking back and it was very special. My first mountain uh, was, it's kind of, it's not that big, but it's just very special for me. And, uh, and then uh, looking back, so after that I was able to summit Many of other mountains, including Amadablam. Amadablam is uh, one of my favorite mountains, and it is uh, 7,000 meter. Uh, it's a little, little less, but uh, it's really considered one of the most beautiful mountains in the world. And this is in Kumbu Valley, and every climber who hiked by this one uh, really would come back for the next trip to climb this. So it's very popular and very beautiful technical mountain. And then the other one, I, I so my 2012, uh, my dream finally came true. So I was uh, able to climb Mount Everest in 2012. But during my KCC course, I met um, Connor Anchor and Peter Athens. They were uh, my instructors, they were my teachers. But I didn't know who they are, so <laughs> so I, I was, uh, they asked me like, you are like, I was one of the advanced student, graduate students. So they asked me, if you want to join expedition, it would be cool. Uh, you want to come with us? And I was very excited. <laughs> yes. And then uh, also very nervous because they are paying me same amount, uh, same as men. And also I had to work same as men in 8,000 meter. But I had a book exciting and nervous and first time on Everest. And so I thought I was, Everest was just my dream. Just I, I said I want to climb Mount Everest one time, and then I will be famous. I don't know. <laughs> that. So, but actually, it didn't happen because after Everest, uh, it was kind of very. It was kind of my starting career actually as a guiding. And then I said, uh, I after Everest, I worked hard and I uh, had a summit Everest, a very successful expedition, and I earned pretty much good money. So I was like, okay, I want this passion to change the depression. So I, I want to be mountain guide. <clears throat> and so I went through the to certification course. I look at and the highest was um, international mountain guide, which is, there's no if any female from Nepal, even from Asia, and there is a lot of less few women in, in the world. So I wanted to, 
to that course and I tried that course. Uh, sorry, I, I take it back. So that course and then at the same time, I also tried Bigger Dream, which is K2. It is, it was like uh, when I was, I was 23 when I was playing K2. <laughs> so we team up with three, two other friends, my climbing partner, Kusan and Maya, and we team up and try to climb K2 because none of any Nepali or South Asian female had climbed K2. So we want to try. And then we went for K2. And then it was in Pakistan. It was very challenging for us women, especially going to Pakistan. And, uh, and also the mountain was so dangerous. And it's very technical. It's far from home and we never traveled really far from our hometown and it is Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So it was very dangerous trip, it was very exciting and also one of my very memorable trip to Pakistan. And I was able to, we were able to climb, summit at K2 and everybody was safely back. So uh, that was K2 and then was the bottle, this is the uh, Baltura Glacier, which is, uh, really big glacier and uh, Pakistan is this is uh, so this next. Uh, so this is a bottleneck from K2, one of the most dangerous place. So you had to cross this part and uh, of course all the whole mountain was very dangerous. So this part was the most dangerous and most of the accident happened this time, this part. So it's a bottleneck, crossing bottleneck and I thought, <laughs> And we were so prepared, if something happens, uh, we will accept it. So, because we, we went for it. So, and then summit, um, uh, made it uh, successfully, <laughs> peed <Pete> down <Jansu. laughs> so, Yeah, and um, so this is a crew where base camp after the summit and uh, very happy moment, so uh, this is kind of six, seven years or eight years ago. So it's one of the best memory. And uh, it is, uh, since then I haven't been back to Pakistan, but then I was, then I was came back. I was kind of pursuing the role to be mountain guide. And so I took the training course. Uh, I went back to my hometown, this is my hometown and the highest training uh, spot is rolling somehow. So the, my hometown was my like a training spot because they have we have really good rock climbing, ice climbing, and it is perfect for the. So I was only one. I was only one female on the whole process. Uh, it took me five years to complete. <laughs> this is my first year. Uh, the first time I had a hot tub, it was a nine month course, and it was it was really. <laughs> really difficult competing with men and because uh, in mountain you, you don't have men and women so you have to be do the same thing together. I had to carry the same stuff, I had to climb the same stuff so it's really hard competing but my first try in 2013, 14 after K2 I did the course but I failed. <laughs> I failed the exam and uh, because I forgot my ice axe, I was there and I messed the exam. So I lost whole uh, one year of course, but then I went back. I was so frustrated and because I thought, okay, I think this is not for girls. Maybe uh, I can't do it. So I had a lot of uh, frustration after failed my first first batch, and then. Uh, then also I have a lot of people that who encourage me that I think you can do this. So I went back again, again another year. So 2014 ink, I went back again and I did the whole thing again and I finally made it. So it wasn't easy. I think the hardest thing I've ever I've done is the IFMGA course, which took me five years. I think I started 23 and I finally completed when I was 28. So a lot of course, a lot of investment, a lot of time and a lot of patience. Uh, so that really, it was really deserving. I mean, so a lot of, uh, this is also uh, during my course that I had to pull like guy up and climb <laughs> to take a lead uh, a lot of, so it's kind of uh, difficult. Uh, 
journey that part because I don't have anybody to look up to that uh, oh female can do this in, especially in our culture so I'm the first one always so I had to to push or like work harder and finally I I became a first certified mountain guide of women and in South Asia or more Asian female guide so John Sub and I finally did it so this is my team and <laughs> although have a was like great really after that I think uh, I got I, it opens me a lot of opportunity to come aboard come to guiding in the US uh, Argentina Europe and a lot of and I'm here today so uh, that was one of my big journey and one of my then once I get the certification, I forgot everything. And there's a lot of girls look up to me and me as a role model. <laughs> <laughs> so then after uh, expectations, after 2000, my certification, 2017, I took a break from Big Mountain and I was traveling to America, US. I guide in Alaska, Argentina, North Cascades and exploring all out of Nepal and learning about more culture. But then 2019, uh, I, as my mentor, uh, I, I got a contract from Conrad, join a scientific expedition. So I was like, I, I, I can't do science, I don't know. So, but, <laughs> so and I thought, okay, I'll see. So we been, we, I went back uh, in 2019, after 2012. So it's, uh, Everest is, really a beautiful community there sure i really like going back and base camp it's just really a, it's kind of second home the base camp is like a big town so it's very good to hang out there so i was like okay i want to go back now uh, so i went back in 2019 the national geographic relax expedition and i was one of the guides and uh, but this expedition was very unique because I used to take a client and the summit and go back, but this expedition, they have so many things going on, a lot of science, a lot of doctors. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a lot of snow, sometimes we feel like, oh, they're playing in the snow and we're so boring. <laughs> but, uh, I think working with scientists is really interesting. We need to know, I got to know a lot about environment, uh, how our impact, what's going on. So uh, it's really, it was really good experience to the, the things, but beginning we, we are so boring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So here is a video. This is uh, uh, Everest with the Howie. You can see the arrow that it can go to, mm -hmm. go camp one, camp two, Western Coombe, and then on Camp 3, Hoaxie Phase goes to South Pole, Mount Everest. So every yellow dot, we had a weather station uh, and we have a different type of, there's ice scoring, weather station, snow sampling, and, uh, but we mostly, mostly work with the weather station and ice scoring. So uh, it was really cool and it's really hard job what the, they do. Uh, this is base camp. Uh, it's uh, springtime, so this is how all the climbers are there. Uh, it's a big town, everybody's there so from the drone. So we, and this is from like Kumbu Ice Fall, it's very popular. And for, for Kumbu climbing, for that, you need to walk at night because. Uh, with the sun, it's kind of melts down, so you can walk at night. And this is where the station, uh, it's camp two looks like, uh, camp two. And so this is on ice fall, uh, tracking jam. Uh, there is, uh, no, we can't skip another way. So you have to go same way up and same way down so sometimes. We had to wait a long like hours and remember we stayed like two hours because especially if there is some slow people ahead of you then it just stops uh stop all everyone so 
there's a ladder up and down and cross. So this is like very um, dangerous zone. Everest we call a Kumbai's fall and you can see how a lot of ice is around and you can fall anytime or just. This is uh, Everest, this is what we call a mini base camp. Uh, this camp too. Uh, we, and you can see all the way to, this is called Hotsi. Uh, Hotsi and this Hotsi phase. Uh, there used to be a lot of, uh, 2012, when I remember, there used to be a lot of snow and that kind of makes easier to climb in the mountain. But these days, uh, it's kind of melting out a lot and that makes a lot of risk in the climbing. A lot of rock falls and uh, icy. If there's snow, it's more easier. Uh, there's like less snow and it's icier rock falls. It's kind of makes dangerous. So it's kind of uh, changing a lot. This time of the, from 2012 to 2019, it's kind of uh, changed a lot. Uh, this is also above it, almost to the camp South Pole. Uh, there's like a nose kind of not too much snow. This is uh, where we are building as a weather station at South Pole and I'm posing for the picture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so we, so this is like, from South Pole, picture from South Pole to summit and balcony. So our team in 2019, due to the very high traffic that we couldn't go past summit. So we kind of, uh, our goal was more not just the summit, so to put the station. So we, our team stopped at balcony and we installed a weather station there. And, uh, but the, for my, my experience, I think getting to balcony is the hardest part with that steep. And then, but from balcony to summit, we couldn't skip that line. And so we were worried that we have two scientists. We don't want to keep them too high because we don't know how to fix the wire. <laughs> 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 so we said, okay, let's do balcony. And then we, so we put the station there and uh, balcony, you can see how, uh, the routes and also a lot, we have, uh, you can see a lot of melted, no much, not much snow. I think if there's more snow, I think it, we, it's much easier. And um, so this is a balcony at uh, 6 a.m. It was really cold morning. Uh, they did really great job. Uh, we were and the station, balcony station and our scientist Tom and Baker was did great job. Their brain works perfect. <laughs> so before they go crazy, they they fixed it. I'm just saying they were great and they're strong. I think very strong team. Uh, so this is our picture after installing uh, wood station. Uh, so we have a lot of team, but uh, everybody was spread out. So we we had we were just few people here but we have uh, more than I think around 10 people there. But your arm is the highest. Yeah my my hand is the highest. <laughs> <laughs> but I can see Baker was tallest but there's no his I can't see his hair. <laughs> yeah so this is like expeditions uh that it was really a really great expedition that we, we, we got to, we didn't summit it, but we had so happy that we are safely back and our goal was to put a station and then we turn around, we didn't make, we didn't make the summit, but we turn around safely. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, and then, uh, then after, there's a different story that is coming later. <laughs> and also, uh, so I have a, I've been to climbing and I, uh, I think a lot of, you know, women in Nepal, I, I am, if I, I had a lot of people inspired what I climbed, but also I, I kind of uh, wanted to give back because I grew up, when I grew up in the young age, I didn't know what to do, who, who to talk and somehow I met a really great mentors on the way, but now uh, as a role model, I used to, I'm helping out a lot of girls, young girls in Nepal. Uh, so I had many stories of young girls being trafficked from villages. 
And life for women, especially young girls for village, is a very difficult in Nepal. In a way, I can identify with the girls in other parts of the country who faced uh, discrimination as I have and, and how that puts life in the risk. So I started working with those traffic, the rescue traffic girls, uh, not to help them. Uh, also the climbing, teaching and introducing outdoor that helps their traumatize or make their confidence, build up the confidence level. So um, because our Sherpa community are so closely needed with the strong family. So we actually, Sherpa community has a kind of more freedom than other community in Nepal. So we enjoy more freedom in our culture as a Sherpa woman, but other other ethnic city, uh, they have kind of hard, hard time as a grading woman. And however, even our community is difficult for a woman to do things as like outside the traditional role because it's uh, you have to be stay home and traveling and going outside is not uh, acceptable and but now the, but if you have a female uh, people like especially like in their homes if you have a female leader they will send your girls out but if you don't if there's like men leading then they are like no you're not allowed to go so I start uh, I start going back to KCC. I start training with a lot of girls from traffic to like want to be professional athletes to like want to be like uh, make a living out of guiding. So I start training. I go back to Nepal and I take these girls every year to Kumbu Climbing Center where I graduate at Kana School. Uh, then I teach them ice climbing and rock climbing and and more than there is a lot of uh, especially like who girl, the girl who be in traffic, they really, it really helps to mentality, confidence. And uh, so I, this is the, it's Kumbu Climbing School, like rock climbing and ice. So, and after this course, after a few trainings, I take them to, I took them like to, to my hometown, Hawaii. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, and then I, I Took them to the summit of Yalongri, first mountain, like um, just next to my hometown. Uh, this is just uh, one day from my home. So I take these girls up in summit and they're so happy to climb the uh, first mountain, which is I never had experience when I was young. And, and climbing is very expensive in the beginning, and especially in Nepal, we cannot afford any gear, clothing, they don't know what to wear, where to go and where to ask. So I help them with the gears. Um, I, I have yeah. very, I have North Face really helped out and a few other organizations which really helps me. So I have, a, I, I think doing this, I climb a lot of mountain, I travel the world. I have achieved really great things, but this makes, I think this is like very, uh, great thing that I did. So I feel really happy and very relieved when I do work with girls and teach them and looking at them being so happy. <laughs> so I think this is a, a part of my life. I think this part of this is this initiative I call as DD initiative. DD means is a sister. Mm -hmm. So DD initiative uh, is kind of a really part of like every Winter, I do this, so it's very special for me. And uh, so, those two, like, now part of this mountain uh, climate, mm -hmm. and also I think mountains are our home. I think as a climber, and uh, mm -hmm. we play there, we climb mountain for a living, and also is a big income source for our community, especially in Nepal, Sherpa society. Everywhere depends on mountains with financial and. Uh, so, and this is uh, like a video clip from Pakistan, uh, 2012, 
So yeah, this is like how this is like on the way from we are when we're going up in Pakistan K2, it was very tiny stream, but when coming back after month, it's, it's melting so fast. And I think uh, we we kind of um, smells the snow and if there is a lot of impact when there is no snow in the mountain because uh, like we need snow for safety also and also we need for water supplies and I think a lot of people down like water towers and mm -hmm. so um, yes. so as, as a as a part of 2019, a National Geographic and Rolex Perpetual Expedition to Mount Everest, our team recovered the highest ice core within the red line. So highest in the world from the South Pole Glacier, this is called South Pole. And uh, recent analysis of the core combined with data from the weather station indicates several decades of accumulations may be Lost on an annual basis now that glacier ice has been exposed. So the result identify extreme sensitivity to glacier surface type of high altitude line ice masses for, for for rapidly emerging impacts as Mount Everest highest glacier appears destiny for which is huge implications for water resource and climbers. So we. Yeah, so this is a, uh, oh, sorry. So this is like a, it's a climate, is I'm so, I, I haven't um, uh, worked with the climate issue, but 2019 kind of taught us a lot of, uh, uh, 2019 exhibition teach, taught me like how we are responsible for our own mountains. So we might not do big things, but I think, uh, little bit of awareness helping out I think is very important and now uh, those things is really serious going on in the mountains and especially in the Himalaya and also climate kind of impacts a lot in a woman's life in Nepal because a lot of things water uh, all those things mostly done by women in Nepal and also now okay so this is all my expedition so I have some few climbs which I've done but I have also not only successful I have also failures <laughs> that did some it did but I have uh, I have experienced a few this is Chuyu in Tibet 2014 and this was uh, this is like my one of my failure expedition and I almost near to the death <laughs> experience so uh, Chuyu and also, this is uh, Kanchenjunga, uh, a third highest mountain in the world. And this is also a uh, failed expedition. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, almost summited, but didn't happen. So we always, the summit is important, but I think uh, we call the coming back home at least the most important. So uh, I think mountain is always there. and we came back so we i might try to come later but i was we turn around and we are safe so mountain we are saying mountain we always there so so coming back home is the most important and it's a real summit and uh, so i have a few another mountain which i summited <laughs> uh this is a uh, mount langdon this is also only only thousand feet, but it is a very special mountain because I did it in a winter ascent, winter first ascent. So Longdo and Totsi, I submitted last spring. Uh, so it's the next to Mount Everest. Mm -hmm. Annapurna one. Uh, this is also very special. I also climbed last spring. <laughs> So in the same month, uh, I climbed, this is my first mountain, which I climbed without oxygen mm -hmm. and uh, able to become a first female Nepali to slum summit it. So it's a very special mountain and it's considered one of the most dangerous yeah. mountain. And uh, yeah, it's yeah. Anaconda 1. <laughs> uh, Manasalu, uh, 
So what are they talking about? Um, <coughs> Sunday did last month, autumn. <laughs> so they all agree. So this boundary is very, uh, all agree one, which is uh, also one of the 800 feet. So this mountain was very tough for me because I had to attempt twice and I was about to give up in second time if I couldn't go because it's just uh, really hard. So finally I signed it uh, last autumn. Uh, so right after Manaslu, I went to summit it a new week. <laughs> so it's great. <laughs> uh, so this is Maklu. Uh, so this is Baker's picture. Uh, we were studying a weather station right here, and you can see from the weather station, it just you can see Mount Maklu, which is fifth highest mountain in the world. And we were weather, we were studying a weather station, and I was looking at the mountains, and and then I was like, oh, I really want that mountain to climb. Then I came to base camp, and I left. Without telling nobody, <laughs> I was a little tired of all the scientists at base camp. So, <laughs> two months. So I went down to Lukla, and I was—I didn't tell anyone because national. And so then I just left, and I climbed in twenty hours from base camp to summit. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I, it was a very special mountain for me because I did the round trip. 30 hours. So, and then uh, Baker and all this team was like, where is the dog on? <laughs> so I started, this is really, yeah, I became first female, I mean, first in college team to summit it, and still I'm alone. And I did the special things because I was I already acclimatized with Everest, so I didn't have to train. So I found the partner, uh, two of us. Three of us went that mountain and did 20 hours up and 10, 10 hours down, 30, minutes, 30 hours round trip. So, uh, and then this, yeah, this is uh, very, one of my favorite climb and uh, it was very big surprise to them. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then, yeah, so sometimes I wonder why I love climbing so much and perhaps it's sense of the freedom that I feel when I climb. And or perhaps when I'm facing a mountain, is uh, is my saying, <laughs> it's just me in the mountains. And that moment, it doesn't matter whether I'm male or female. It certainly doesn't matter how society judges it's me. What matters is how I engage with that mountain. So at that moment, so So for the all challenges and hardship that I could get had to overcome, I know I have been quite fortunate compared to millions of women in Nepal mm -hmm. and who did not get similar opportunities. And so my, yeah, this is uh, my, next to my hometown, my home. We used to go get water there when we were little young. So uh, I grew up looking at ice like this in the winter, but you never know we're gonna climb one day. <laughs> so this is one on my training course that I had to climb, we had to climb ice. And so it's now it's really good. To, so my hometown is now really good uh, winter sports, best ice climbing in Nepal. And back in 10 years ago, we didn't know how to climb ice and we don't have that culture. Uh, but now there is like changing a lot of uh, activities going on. We have a lot of tourists coming to ice climb in my hometown. So it's uh, getting a lot of changes. And so my hope is that uh, the small success of mine will inspire other girls and follow their dreams. I hope they will believe that if they follow the passion and determination and grit and dedication, anything is possible. <laughs> and I hope that they will doubt, they will not doubt themselves and I hope they will pursue their passion uh, or whatever makes them happy. Uh, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Dawa. We do have some time for some questions. So feel free to 
Raise your hand and uh, yeah. Are you gonna go climbing while you're staying here? Yeah. Are we gonna find grandfather? <laughs> <laughs> Any rock climbing? Sorry? Any rock climbing? Uh, no, I haven't brought anything, so. <laughs> how have your how has your family accepted you since your role that you kind of taken on is such a different path than what you don't to do? Actually, my family, I think um, they didn't like me in the beginning. Uh, uh, so they didn't accept me when I was doing first time climbing. Uh, one, it was okay. Two, it was okay. I keep, I keep going back and back. So, uh, but now they will understand because I was first female. I was the first woman from my hometown to go into outdoor things. But then later I was, uh, I would travel the world and I had this, I built this, I brought this change into the climbing. So now there is a, Four other girls trying to also go for climbing, and I was I'm not only one now. So I think now they've been changing it. Now the community kind of look at me and um, see see that they they encourage their sister's daughter to climb and travel. So it's been good change. And uh, I think back in days, ten years ago when I started climbing, I'm into climbing since I'm 2009. So uh, in my teenage, so that time we don't have a culture that climbing is a sport and climbers are athletes. But now I'm becoming, I am becoming first Nepali to be in the international brand to represent the North Face and Rolex. It's such a big brand. Now they look at like oh, this is also a sport and you can make a living out of it. So now they are very proud. And I think a whole community, whole country is being really proud. <laughs> Uh, but it's just beginning is kind of uh, this wasn't uh, wasn't very fun, uh, not acceptable. So we had to go through a lot of um, culture issues. Mm -hmm. um, so you've become an inspiration to many. But when you were first starting, what was your biggest inspiration, and what drove you to complete all these great things? Yeah, first I want to be because. I live in a mountain town and a lot of men, like most all the all the family in the Nepal or Walling go to climb our rest for make money. And that was the job. And then uh, and then they climb our Everest. And then they will say they make a lot of money and they are famous. So that's what I started first. <laughs> <laughs> But then, uh, then I later I found out like uh, there's a, as a guiding perspective for international is uh, you can see a lot of uh, Western women coming and you know you you can look at them and they are so cool and I we want to be the same. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are moments that you think, oh, this is so dangerous. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What? So is there a moment that you think uh, that this is so dangerous? So I want to quit. I don't want to do it again. I think uh, it's, it happens in every mountain. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this is this gonna be last. I don't want to come back, and then you come back home, and then you look at the picture, and I want we think about where, where, what next, what. Oh. <laughs> so it's, I think this happens every mountain, but I especially felt like. And the K2, I was like, okay, this is my last month. I'm not going to climb. So, but then it didn't happen. Yeah, so this, I summited 14, seven out of 14. So I have seven on the list. So I think I plan to go a uh, couple years. <laughs> Can you talk a little more about how you got involved in your mentorship network and the relations with the faculty? Say it again. So, can you talk a little bit more about your mentorship yet? Oh, yeah, a mentor with the women. With yeah, the with women. the women. Yeah, so. 
I work with a lot of uh, not only traffic, but uh, some of like traffic and who survived, uh, came back, especially traffic in India. Mm -hmm. I have a few girls who I worked with, with them uh, from like they are in the shelters and and they because once they survive from the the big their victim they feel like they they are like they have a really mental pressure mm -hmm. but also there is another girls like I want to be like you or I want to make a living of climbing and also some of there's a lot of girls so I um, I combine them all together maybe let's say make a ten or fifteen groups and especially for this traffic women uh, girls. I kind of help them to like um, get out of the the thing and make confident because so I have uh, there's different type of different um, groups of girls like put it together and they connect each other. Some are funny, some are like they have different stories. So when you do a trips like two weeks trip and they they engage each other and they really then the all these girls kind of speak up and try to share the stories and that's how and also some of the girls I've been training them to be professional like um, guiding and how to train how to guide how to make a living of trekking so uh, if <clears throat> I prepare I train them only climbing or guiding also sometimes if I have a client like female team client and then they can help out with me and I think a lot of uh, a female trekkers also prefer a lot of women, but there's a lot of women who are very physically strong. They don't have the, how, how the job, they don't get a job. Mm -hmm. So I helped out with training and also getting them a job. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I have a few, two, like some girls, like, can you recommend me somebody? Then they do this thing. So, especially, but but especially for the traffic girls, it's more about their. Uh, traumatize and help the heal and just uh, be outside and I think like climbing mountain they never thought about it so mm -hmm. and when they summited mountain like a peak but it's just small 5,000 is kind of small <laughs> <laughs> but they feel like oh I achieved something and I can do this and I can I have to do this so I have a really good stories of girls who've been trafficked and climbing with me and they have uh, they can prove and the confidence comes out and very, very like, confident to, to sh like, like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, building on that, how can we help support that program? Is, um, is there a way to donate or what, what can we do? Yeah, I, 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 this is, this is my second year doing this thing. It's kind of getting bigger, but I haven't, I think ha I, I kind of do from, like my thing, so I don't have anything. Just I just not promoting anything. But I think uh, now looking at thing, I think I need to do something. But it just uh, from my sponsor, like uh, relax sometimes. Sometimes my North Face kind of helps out, mm -hmm. but I don't have anything like can donate. But uh, it's just from the personal people just uh, helping out. But I have to, this is just I do because I feel much better, mm -hmm. so I haven't promoted yet and. Just I would be looking for that. <laughs> in the Sherpa community, what's like the main goal? Is it to get there the fastest or like to get the most amount of people up? Or is there like any, I guess, like for the Sherpa? Mm -hmm. Sherpa, actually, Sherpa is a, my last name is Sherpa. And uh, Sherpa is a uh, people from Eastern part of Tibet who migrate to Nepal. And we call it people from East. But we have our own ethnic city, what is one of the ethnic city in Nepal, and this Sherpa, and who lives in the mountain. But uh, also, they are used to climb a lot. Uh, they used the, the Western people came and they are climbing together a lot. So the Sherpa are stronger in the mountain, and they play because they live in really high altitude. So the Sherpa became like by like Tenzin Norge, a lot of Sherpa. It just becomes so popular because what the Sherpa is. Um, also became a brand <laughs> name, but this is actually we have Sherpa dress, Sherpa food. Actually, this is my family name. So it's sometimes it's very hard questions. But also now the people who work in the mountain are all Sherpa. So, <laughs> so, so, so I think for in that case, the, the Sherpa guides are like more into fixing the roof, uh, 
of taking care of summit and mostly above base camp is a whole all Sherpa people mostly. Mm -hmm. And they're like, I think they're, they're culturally all Sherpa. So it's just became a Sherpa. Mm -hmm. So now my name is Dawa, I have a Sherpa. It doesn't mean I'm a work, I'm not, it's my type of things, but this Sherpa is my last name. Also <coughs> uh, now it's known as, uh, <laughs> Yeah, so but they mostly like carriage, uh, fixing, rescuing, climbing, or like above this camp, it's all, all, all share about what they do, like safety and everything. Well, thank you for all the, the great questions. Unfortunately, there's a class coming in, so we're going to have to vacate. <laughs> but if you have other questions or want to talk to Dallas, feel free to stay around. So thank you. So much.